and make sure that every single character in it is correct. Has anybody here actually done that? <laughs> I did it as part of writing the SSH book because I, I needed to be able to honestly say I had done it. Uh, and having done it, I can authoritatively state that it's really terrible. <laughs> You're a masochist. I did it once. I, I write books. Yes, I'm a masochist. I'm, <laughs> it's included. I come out here and talk to you people. <sighs> so, it can be done. Re in the real world, you as the sysadmin need to automate. Start with SSH keygen, minus LF, grab the, uh, the fingerprint from the key file, add it to a file. Um, you can also use the program SSH key scan, which lets you sit at a desk and scan the SSH servers on your network and capture those fingerprints. That requires either you A, trust your network and trust that the remote server has not already been compromised, which is, depends entirely on your network. Um, I'm used to running servers on the naked internet working for ISPs. This is an invalid assumption. It may be that behind the firewall at Ford, perhaps they're better off, I don't know. I've, I've, I've never hacked into Ford's network. I have no clue, sorry. Um, but once you have these keys, you make them available. They, the, the usual suggestions are a secure website. They tell you don't send it out over email. Don't put it unencrypted on the public internet. Really, the only thing you can do is automate it. Uh, those scans will generate a known hosts file for SSH. You can distribute that. How many of you are using Puppet, Ansible? Uh, so the known hosts file is easy Ansible bait. You know, it's copy this file to all the hosts and now you're up to date. It is well worth doing. It's an easy security game. Uh, similarly, Putty. Uh, Putty's known host cache is a registry file. If, you're, if you are using Windows and you have to worry about uh, making sure all of these hosts are really the hosts they claim to be, grab that registry file. Go to your Windows guy and say, hey, I need all the people on the Unix team to have this lump. And they will make it happen. Some Domain, admin, policy, honkity, whatever. I, I don't know. I, I try not to get into that. So, both clients, at any client, presents the key fingerprint. But now and then you get a warning that the key fingerprint has changed. Um, how many of you have seen that message that says, Oh, the, key, the fingerprint has changed. Well, doom, doom, doom. How many of you have said, Yeah, whatever, and clicked, get the new key? How many of you disabled the whining? Yes. <laughs> how many of you disabled the whining? Okay. There's a few reasons why this might be happening. But every one of them means you need to stop and think. The sysadmin may have screwed up. If someone else manages the machine, this is a great chance for you to force them to admit that they are mortal. <laughs> every sysadmin needs to do this every now and then for their own good. Um, maybe the client is wrong. Maybe your client has been compromised. Maybe you're getting corruption in files or registry. Something could be happening there. Um, did they upgrade the server? It wasn't too long ago that OpenSSH added uh, the ECDSA keys. And after I ran an upgrade, all of a sudden the network monitoring system lit up in red and 
The support staff received a couple hundred emails saying, Keys have changed, the world is ending. And well, yes. Uh, it, it took us a while to figure out what had happened because, of course, the servers install these new keys automatically. Um, round Robin DNS, that's another common culprit. And the last thing is perhaps the intruder controls the server, perhaps you have a man in the middle attack, perhaps something is seriously wrong. It's perfectly fine to. to admit that for some reason the keys on this host have had needed to be regenerated. It is better if you are in doubt to create a new host key for your clients to connect to than use one that may be compromised. I'll add another to the list. System is a lab system that gets restated several times a day. And you have no idea. <laughs> yes, you people who are working in labs and yeah, you, you make your own problems. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about OpenSSH as the client. Um, ever so often, OpenSSH doesn't do what you think it should. And you scream and wail and go running for Stack Exchange and read the man page and check the book that that idiot Lucas wrote, and it's not in there either. Of course it's not. So, how do you find out what's going on? SSH-V, uh, verbose mode, will print the debugging information for your client to the screen, intermixed with your session. Now, you can redirect that to another file. But, if you actually read the output, it will tell you things. And usually, you can figure out why you're not connecting from that. So, at the client level, <coughs> um, you have a, a couple different config files. There's the global one in Etsy. And you can have an individual con personal config in .SSH that will override the global settings. Now your, your sysadmin has carefully handcrafted the global configuration file for your convenience, but if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, go right ahead. You have that option. Um, almost all configuration options that make sense for SSHD work in the SSH client. One common thing with a client is you may have a different username on a different server. Um, so if I have to connect to a customer server, I get them to assign me a username. Oddly enough, it's always something like jerkface. You can use the username, the at sign, and the server name, or the minus L argument to set the username. Hmm. You can also do this in the config file. So that SSA, open SSH will just handle it for you. I've made copious use of this. Uh, uh, one of my automotive jobs, the organization had five different standards for usernames. Depending on the type of system, the operating system, and when it was deployed. This is the only bit this user option is the only thing that saved my sanity. Uh, you can use the minus P flag to change port uh, and set that in the config file as well. So, PuTTY is the de facto standard for Windows SSH clients. There are others. Some of them are better. Some of them cost money. Putty is the, the common denominator. Um, it's not by the folks who write OpenSSH. It's still pretty good. When you download it, download the full installer. There's a couple tools in the full installer. What do you mean by that? By not by OpenSSH? OpenSSH is written by the folks from OpenBSD. They have one of 
the most secure network operating systems in the world. Um, they've identified an entirely new classes of ways to break into systems and swept their own operating system and the SSH code for those classes of bugs. Um, OpenBSD uh, open and anything they write is really, really hard to break into. So, uh, I, I would say the people, my wife is a psychiatric nurse practitioner. She informs me that paranoia is the feeling that people are out to get you. In the case of the internet, that happens to be true. But you're still paranoid. It's just well-founded. So, um, but you're saying that, that Putty basically doesn't need the old BSD standard. It just wasn't the, written by them. Putty wasn't was written by written. one guy. Basically. There's one guy who writes Putty, and he does a pretty good job of it. Every now and then, there's a security update for it because he missed something. Now, a client is a little easier to secure than the server. Nobody is, pro nobody is probing the internet looking for your open putty install that's listening for connections. Read the FAQ that he provided. It's a hoot. Yes, his FAQ is, is worth reading. Um, as I said, there are better clients out there. But this is pretty standard. I use it myself. Uh, I also use OpenSSH client on Windows. It, it's a question of what's going on at the moment. Is it more applicable to the, to the Windows environment as opposed to, let's say, Unix? Most, well, Putty runs on Unix-like systems. It's a little prettier. Um, Putty runs on almost anything. But it is, uh, most Unix-like users use OpenSSH. It comes with the system. So if you use PuTTY, one of the things that really annoys me is having to go in and make the same change for every single setting, or every single connection. You can uh, set, when you first open PuTTY, there's a session called default settings. If you change something in that, it takes effect for all sessions that follow. It doesn't go and retroactively write sessions you've previously created. Um, but, for example, on all of my systems, I have the same username. I set that as the default. Um, and then save that in the default settings. On all of my hosts, I want X11 forwarding turned on in the SSH client. I control whether that's available on the server or not. So, like the OpenSSH client, Putty has debugging. There is an event log in the upper left hand button. And you can also do a session log where you, you have to start the session log before opening the connection. But this will give you all sorts of good stuff about the inside of Putty. Putty keeps all of its config in the registry. If you are a Windows user and you have a new laptop and you don't want to set up all these connections again, oh, please, no. Grab the registry key, export it, take it to your new machine, plug it in. And yes, you can just distribute this via Active Directory. I am assured by the AD admins I know that this is very easy. Okay. Are there any questions on what we've touched on so far? So it has to do with uh, you have a system that you're trying to determine, uh, do diagnostics, right? Yes. And use SSH to diagnose the system is up, you know, whether it's working properly, whether you can connect to it, things like that. Do you have, can you just might be go through like a real quick hit list on what you would do to, I mean, so you, you touched on that a little bit. I'm just interested in knowing a little bit more about, I want to find out if my SSH is running properly on my server. 
Okay. Um, is SSH running properly on the server? Well, the short answer is, if you get a log, if you get a command line prompt, it's running correctly. If you don't, it isn't. But the interesting question is, how far in the process does it get? Um, I have seen SSH. I've seen machines break in such a way that the SSH connection seems to complete, and I can log in at the console, but SSH doesn't give me a command prompt, and at the end it says that it's hanging trying to allocate a VTY. It's because it has real terminal sessions on the console, but it can't allocate a virtual terminal for your SSH session. Um, you can, the client may say, okay, I'm con I've connected to port 22, and I'm talking to the SSH daemon. Uh, hello, SSH daemon. Uh, hello. And nothing's answering there, so you know that the connection died very early in the process. Perhaps the, the process that uh, listens to port 22 is open, but it can't spawn the lower privilege listener. Um, the most common error I have seen, or that I have discovered through SSH debugging mode, is timeout waiting for DNS. Going back to that use DNS, no. I will say. Properly also means not doing extra things like unexpected, like being a Trojan SSHD that like, yes. logs everything. <laughs> um, that's where debugging can help as well. Where you know, oh, why are you talking to this thing here? Yes, yeah. I would encourage you not just for SSH, but for any process that you're responsible for. Run it a couple times in debugging mode. See what normal looks like, because until you know what normal looks like, um, it's really hard to know what what is abnormal. I mean, uh, when they were trying to figure out that my appendix had gone bad, uh, the doctor looked at the CAT scan and said, well, that ain't right. Because he, he knew what was supposed to be there, and he didn't know what was going on in me, but he knew that didn't look like anything he'd seen before. Yeah, I didn't have that. Then they know right away that uh, yeah. you got a problem with your appendix. Yes, but my pain was over here. That's That's not, uh, oh, the pancreas was fine. See, you have to know what normal looks like before. So you had referred pain. I had referred pain. I'm special. In a non, in a non typical location. That Absolutely. Occur, it's kind of like how you get a heart attack, but you feel it maybe in your arm instead yes. of in your chest. And your software can do the same thing. See? But you have to know the equivalent of a hand should have five fingers before you can say, well, that, that doesn't look right. So run all of your software in debugging mode a couple times. Copy the output. Maybe you'll never need it. Maybe you'll wish you had it. Be, be curious. That's yeah, be curious. I mean, as, as sysadmins, I, I love to find a new knob. Hey, what happens if I twiddle this? Oh, oh, okay. No, no, let, let's not touch that again. <laughs> uh, for the record, virtualization is a wonderful thing. You don't want to know how we did this when all we had were production servers. Um, <coughs> lots of prayer. Yes, yes, lots of prayer. So, copying files over SSH. Um, FTP actually predates TCP IP. How, has 
has anyone here used a connection over NP? Okay, good. It's died along. It, it's long overdue for death. Um, at, the file transfer protocol ran on the internet protocol that existed before TCP/IP, and it was forward ported. And there, you will see the legacy of that in things like .NET RC files. Yes. Yes. .NET was bad enough. So, how many of, is anybody here still using rsync? Okay. How about RCP, RSH? Uh, Jeff, Mr. O'Connor really should know better. Please hit him. Remember Thank those you. those aforementioned <laughs> lab machines? Yeah, there's no reason to have a lab. Okay, the whole reason as the whole reason Open SSH exists is to kill. R login, RCP, and all of those protocols. If we have time, I'll, I'll go into that story. Because I, I, I think it's a great example of how a small group of people can change the entire world. So, um, apps like rsync can travel over SSH. Uh, that's one way to copy files. But there are two SSH specific copy tools, SCP and SFTP. How many of you use SCP? Okay, <coughs> you're all wrong. Um, SCP was written for a direct drop in replacement of RCP, the unencrypted, unauthenticated remote copy protocol. Um, that is why. SCP uses different command line flags than any other program uh, in the SSH suite because it's stealing them from RCP. Every so often, someone will scream, well, you know, why does SCP use a, cap a dash capital P to set the port instead of the small p, like everything else? And the answer is, well, this program was not meant for you. Um, SFTP is designed specifically for SSH. It's a newer protocol. It is actively maintained and improved over time. Um, the SCP program itself is basically maintained. I mean, they, they don't let it rot. But the protocol itself is dead. And a lot of people really wish that SCP itself would die. But so many people picked it up when you really weren't supposed to, and now they live with it. Kind of putting the gray area, it's a little maintained and little is it. Is it a zero or a one? It's, uh, it's grab, grab a rabbit, turn it over, rub its feet. And in other words, kind of quantum in nature. Yes. Use <laughs> SFTP. You put one in, you get two answers it's out. It's in maintenance mode. <laughs> maintenance mode. Yeah. Okay. SFTP looks a lot like regular FTP. You can also use it like SCP to just copy a file on the fly. Uh, if you're Why Windows, you Putty, yes? Why do you recommend man over rsync uh, through SSH? It's a different tool. Um, copying a file, you want a tool like a shovel, which is what SFTP is for. R-Sync is like the whole wheelbarrow. You want to pick up the whole directory tree and shuffle it over. Um, yes, you could put that one scoop in R-Sync and trundle it over in the wheelbarrow. Um, and that's a really horribly mixed metaphor. But there's no reason you can't, but people will look at you kind of funny. I'm used to that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you. I, I, I wasn't going to say that on camera, Brian. Thank you. You say it's free for personal use, restrictions to distribute. What is its license? Um, well, let me go over the first part of the slide first. If you're a Windows user, there are command line apps like PSCP that are included with Putty. If you want a nice GUI app, use WinSCP. 
it gives you nice right-click menus that say, you know, send to SCP, copy to this host. Um, it gives you the explorer style, style window or the commander style split window. Um, the license on WinSCP is basically, you can't hand it off to your clients. You must tell your clients to go download it themselves. What is it like, I mean, you know, there's like freeware, there's open, you know, there's, you know. I would have to go back and look at the license again. It's probably some proprietary it's, license. It is commercial code. So it is proprietary, it, it's not uh, new Michael, or anything like that. You got about 35, 40 minutes. Okay, thank you. We probably need to. Yeah. Okay, key based authentication. Most of you are using keys, so I'm going to kind of tread lightly through here. Um, I'm going to make an offer for everybody in this room who is not using keys. You all saw how everybody around you was using key based authentication. <laughs> Grab one of them and get them to help you if you need it. This is really not hard. Um, and once you use key-based authentication, you will not understand how you live without it. Is there anybody here who uses keys for login for more than a couple months and says, you know, passwords were just better and easier? Does anybody say that? <laughs> you are the first person to ever raise your hand. But the reason is I'm in a lab where everything is just doesn't count. Everything just we just yeah. create stuff on the fly and Labs throw it away. Don't count. And, Actually, your lab is poorly designed. You should be using a deployment system that installs <coughs> runs for you. So I have to build a deployment system. But yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but you're the first person who's ever been shameless enough to raise his hand. I I applaud you. So, um, so, actually, I should go back. Uh, passwords are weak. Yes. What do you mean by a key? Is it a physical device? No. Uh, a software key. A, a public-private key pair exactly like used in, uh, sorry, a different format, but basically just like what's used in a web server or for your SSH server to identify itself. Um, basically, you have a public and a private key. Your public key you give to the server. Your private key you keep for yourself encrypted with a passphrase. When you want to log in, you use your passphrase to unlock your key. Um, the, the key is encrypted with a pretty straightforward, the, the private key is encrypted with a pretty straightforward algorithm. You enter your passphrase and SSH uses your passphrase as the key to decrypt the key. Um, if your private key file is stolen, you, uh, that encrypted file is useless without the passphrase. You can create a new key, you're done. Your passphrase should be too long to guess by brute force, too complex to guess, and too long to shoulder surf. Um, and for all of you shoulder surfers out there, I use a Dvorak keyboard, sucks to be you. <laughs> um, use you, numbers. Forgot. you forgot, easy to type on your phone. What? <laughs> no, that's I no broke. Broke. I, No broke. no like it. Is that for security through obscurity, or is it you do it for the speed? For, for typing speed. So, <laughs> this slide keeps getting mentioned, <laughs> or sorry, this comic keeps getting mentioned whenever the topic of past phrases comes up. So I gave up, and I put it in the presentation. I hope you're happy. Um, we've all used these passphrases like the passwords up in the upper left that are hard to remember and complex. 
A string of common English words that is longer is actually more secure than that eight characters of gibberish. Not true anymore. Yeah. Depends on how you're using it.